You know, when I was your age, go ask your mother. I know you don't like it. It builds character. How many times do I have to tell you? I'm not just talking to hear my own voice. Hello, listener, and welcome to Datages. I'm your host, Chad Hagel. And if you are looking for some fatherly wisdom for your career, your family, or any other aspect of your life, then you've come to the right place. If you want to learn more about Datages, find additional content, submit questions or feedback to me, or if you want to know if that mental picture you have of me after hearing my voice matches my real face, visit datages.com. Thanks for being here. And before you listen to our podcast, please listen to your father. Datages friends and family, welcome back for another installment of Datages. Today I'm going to peel back the curtain and share some production insights with you. This past week was a challenging week for us here at Datages. We fell a bit behind in our production cycle and we really had to buckle down to get this episode delivered to you on time. Here's why. First, it's a holiday week. This episode is being produced during the Passover and Easter holiday season and the month of Ramadan as well for all of our Muslim friends and family. In these holiday periods, it's really hard to accomplish anything that depends on anyone else. And I don't know if all of you have noticed a phenomenon that I've seen that seems to be more pronounced this year than it has in the past. Spring break has become a month. Every school system across the country, and even every independent school system here in Texas, seems to have adopted a different week for their spring break. I haven't had a single week in the past month when I didn't hear at least three times, so-and-so is on vacation for spring break with his or her family. As a CEO and a career-long entrepreneur, this is a foreign concept to me. While I do find times to disconnect, I don't really take vacations where I fall completely off the grid and cease to function or become totally inaccessible to my team or to outside clients and partners. More often than not, when I'm on vacation, no one outside my company even knows I'm gone. Part of this is due to the skills of my handlers, as I call them. I have a fantastic executive assistant named Dana and an administrative coordinator for my philanthropic activities named Michelle. Dana and Michelle certainly handle my schedule a lot better than I do. I would never criticize someone for taking a total vacation and shutting themselves down to the professional world wholesale. I'm just saying that's not me. I've talked to you before about how seamlessly I've integrated my life professionally, personally, and philanthropically, and this extends to vacation. One of the development officers with whom I work at Stanford can attest to this. I serve as a co-chair on my reunion campaign, and I'm her first ever class reunion campaign chair call taken from a chairlift while snowboarding with my son. I guess I was her first ever chair on a chair. Sorry, I'm getting off topic. Here at Datages, we hit a bit of a lull in the production cycle this week as well, because we're working on some great interview episodes coming up. We'll be bringing you multiple interviews with some really informative and insightful guests in our series on It Takes Credit to Make Money. On top of that, our team, particularly our executive producer, Dustin, is in the final stages of preparing our new episode format, The Entrepreneur's Corner, which will premiere soon. While we are very excited about it, it has pulled our team out of the normal production cycle to plan this new content type. In our second episode in this series, we'll bring you all of our friends and family into that planning process to give you a sneak preview of Entrepreneur's Corner. Finally, as we will discuss in the next couple of episodes, by far the most significant and consistent impacts to time management in my company and in my life stem from my engagement with general contractors and construction. And apparently, Datages is not immune to these impacts as evidenced this week. In this particular case, I had a general contractor performing a small but very loud project at my house. They fell behind on the project by two or three days, and they were still sawing, grinding, and banging on Thursday when we were scheduled to have an interview with Spencer Burton that was slated for publication in this week's rotation. I tested the sound in my home studio, and trust me, you are very happy we didn't try to record that day. You would not be having a pleasant experience if you were listening to that episode now. 
So all of this put us behind, and I'm on my way with the family to visit my mom in Florida for Easter. So I'm composing this episode on the fly. We'll wrap up the recording late on Sunday night, and I'll turn it over to my post-production team and count on them to turn it around quickly for publication. Phew! Welcome to the life of a moonlighting creator. Moonlighting in the literal sense of the word this week. But here's the good news. All of what I have shared is a very important and relevant backdrop for today's episode of Datages, and a datage I've been meaning to share with you for a while now. Today's datage is this. The distance between success and failure in my career has been measured by one variable, the ability to create a sense of urgency. This week, I had the sense of urgency created for me and the team, as I've explained. And now I get to channel that urgency in creating this highly topical episode for you. Time. There are so many expressions regarding the importance of time. Henry Ford said, time does not like to be wasted. There's an expression attributed to folklore, time waits for no one. And here are a couple of expressions about time from some very notable and wise men with whom I don't necessarily agree. William Shakespeare wrote in The Merry Wives of Windsor, better three hours too soon than a minute too late. While this sounds like good advice regarding punctuality, I think it actually speaks to terrible time management skills. I don't know about you, but my time is far too important to me to show up for anything three hours early. Consider my approach to air travel as a prime example. I always try to minimize my time at the airport in order to maximize my productive time by arriving at the airport at exactly the time I need to be there to comfortably make it through security and to my plane for boarding time. Now that I travel a lot more internationally, the definition of a comfortable airport arrival time has shifted for sure. It's more like two hours versus 40 minutes prior to my flight these days, but I still try to manage that time as effectively as I can. I also don't accept meetings ahead of schedule. If someone arrives at my office 15 minutes ahead of a scheduled meeting, I actually find it rather frustrating. I feel pressure to change my schedule, to stop whatever I'm doing and to accommodate the early arrival. I realize I'm perfectly entitled to have them wait until the scheduled meeting time, and believe me, I do, but I still feel pressure to be hospitable and meet with that person ahead of the schedule. There's a somewhat legendary example from the NFL of a coach who definitely believes Shakespeare's philosophy about being early. Tom Coughlin, the former coach of the Jacksonville Jaguars and the New York Giants, was famous for instituting Tom Coughlin time. Under his system, meetings always started five minutes ahead of schedule. And if you arrived later than five minutes ahead, you were late. And you got fined thousands of dollars. According to Eli Manning, all of the players started turning their clocks ahead by five minutes in order to avoid the fines. For them, time truly was money. And that's the second wise expression with which I don't fully agree. Ben Franklin is credited with the common expression, time is money. To me, time is far more valuable than money. As we have discussed in the last two episodes of Datages, If I follow the right process, I can always find more money. But no matter how skillful or wise a man may be, he is never going to find another minute in his life beyond those he is allotted. It is for this reason that I make most of my business decisions based upon a return on time versus a return on cost analysis. No matter how you slice it, I think we can all agree that time is precious. And that's why I'm investing my time into producing this important episode of Datages for you. Friends and family, we are going to explore two basic aspects of time and its relationship to the business environment. The first part of the discussion, which will be covered in today's episode, will address how time relates to business strategy and the pursuit of opportunities. The second part of the discussion will appear in a second episode on this two-part series, and we'll focus on principles of sound project management and how the notion of creating a sense of urgency is applied in the project management process. So when I talk about creating a sense of urgency in business, what do I really mean? And why is it so important? I've found in business that if things are allowed to happen on their own time, that timeline becomes geologic in nature. Sure, things might happen in the long run, 
But as John Maynard Keynes, a famous economist from the early 20th century, said, in the long run, we're all dead. Keynes is one of my personal favorites in the study of economics. We've placed a link to one of his most noteworthy publications, The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money, in the bulletin board. Why does everything take forever? It's easy to just say, everyone in the world is lazy, and just leave it at that. But that's not a very enlightened or particularly helpful perspective. It's pretty narrow-minded, potentially disrespectful to people who are not actually lazy, and it's defeatist. Because if we just say people are lazy and don't go any further to understand the systemic factors that create time delays and lack of results, we don't empower ourselves to try to influence circumstances in our favor to get things to happen with the greatest sense of urgency that we can. So I've taken the time to think about it. And here are three reasons, I believe, that timelines are naturally extended seemingly infinitely. Number one, newsflash. Your priorities are not everyone else's priorities. Wouldn't the world be great if what was most important to you was exactly what was most important to everyone else? We would accomplish so much together. But alas, there's that whole free will and individuality thing. Such a pain in the ass. Number two, institutional structures are designed to punish mistakes, not to award achievement. I've spoken at length in our series on philanthropy about how inefficiently large institutions operate in both the for-profit and particularly in the non-profit sectors. In my business, I deal with a lot of governmental entities, and they are probably the most poorly incentivized organizations where there is zero possibility of someone being rewarded or really even recognized for getting anything done but they can certainly be held accountable and often scapegoated when something goes wrong. We'll talk about working with agencies like this in just a minute. Number three, it is part of human nature to procrastinate. People are more apt to look for reasons not to do things than they are to look for motivation to do something. I've become a student of procrastination. Not so I can practice it with expert skill, but so I can learn to diffuse it or counter it in dealing with people in business settings. This is where the art of creating a sense of urgency really comes into play. Now let me move on to share with you another story from the early part of my career that still serves as a shining example of creating a sense of urgency in a business setting with mission-critical positive outcomes. In the last episode of Datages, I shared with you the story of our first client, Eckerd Pharmacy. If you didn't listen, you should go back. Check it out. This will give you better context for this coming story. Let me tell you the next chapter. I alluded to the fact that Eckerd was ultimately acquired by CVS Pharmacy. This would prove to be a fantastic opportunity for us because we ultimately upgraded from being an Eckerd developer to becoming a developer for CVS, which was a much larger and stronger company. But it didn't just happen automatically, and it could have been a disaster. When the acquisition started brewing, our closest relationships at Eckerd were kind enough to give us the briefest of advance warning, but advance warning nonetheless. We had eight deals pending with Eckerd at the time, seven in New Mexico and one in Arizona. Pending means that Eckerd had fully approved the deals. We had millions of dollars in expended project costs invested in them, but we lacked signed leases. If we didn't get the leases signed, CVS could have canceled the leases during the acquisition and left us hanging. We would have lost millions of dollars in capital from our partners, and we would have been out of business. And we weren't alone. There were developers around the country who were facing the same exposure with Eckerd deals hanging in the balance. So what did we do? Damon started a world tour of all of our land sellers to keep our deals intact through the uncertainty created by rumors of the acquisition in the marketplace. And I jumped on a plane and flew to Eckerd headquarters in Florida. I was employing another important adage, when all else fails, just show up. On my flight, I dug into every lease we had on the table with Eckerd. I identified every piece of information that was missing and mobilized our consultants to produce any exhibits or drawings we needed to button up the leases. And when I got to Florida, I showed up to Eckerd's headquarters, not necessarily unannounced, but certainly uninvited. I convinced Chris Salemi to set me up with one of the Eckerd in-house attorneys, and I created a war room for myself in a vacant conference room. The next four days were spent directly engaged with Eckerd counsel to get 
all eight of our leases completed. If you're doing the math, that's two leases per day. I have never accomplished something like that in my career, and I've never accomplished anything like that since then. How did I pull off this miracle? First, as I said, I showed up. No one else did. There was no other developer sitting in Eckerd's office during those final days of the company. Second, I brought donuts. That's the second half of the dadage. When all else fails, just show up and bring donuts. This sounds like a joke, but it's actually quite serious. You'd be surprised at how far carbs and fat can take you in life. And by being in the Eckerd office with donuts and a smile and a laptop, I countered the three points I gave you earlier about why things in life and business have infinite timelines. By being present, I made my priorities the top priorities of the Eckerd attorneys and executives. As I said, I was the only one there in the office with them. I was an inescapable priority. I'm sure behind closed doors, they were saying to themselves, we really need to get this guy out of here. Boom, instant priority. I was also able to enfranchise both the attorneys and the real estate executives into a common mission. So we were working on something together rather than me asking them for something from afar. This effectively bypassed the conventional corporate structure that would not have rewarded the Eckert team for achievement. I was providing them with real-time achievement and gratitude. They could see the results of their work and feel good about them as we worked together toward a common goal. And obviously, with the immediate deadlines that had been set and the impending acquisition by CVS, there was no room for procrastination on anyone's part. We were heads down and plowing forward. So what was the outcome of this crazy process? I got all eight leases signed. I was the only developer in the system to get leases out of Eckerd in those final days. The CVS acquisition of most of Eckerd's assets went through. And here's the real kicker. CVS decided they didn't want any of the Eckerd stores in New Mexico. They didn't like the market. If I had not gotten the leases signed, they would have terminated seven of the eight deals outright after the acquisition. It would have been the end of the road for Damon and me. But since we had the signed leases, they were obligated to complete the projects and pay us rent, even though they were not going to occupy them. Ultimately, the stores would be sold off for other uses. They became things like an Ace Hardware store, a Hastings bookstore, a couple of Walgreens, ironically, and one Chinese buffet. I recently had the opportunity to drive through Albuquerque with my son, Brayden, and I actually showed him a few of these locations that were part of the first generation of my career. As a side note, the senior vice president of real estate for CVS, Dino de Thomas, who is like the godfather of retail real estate would approach me one day, a couple of years later, and confess to me, you know, the biggest mistake CVS ever made under my leadership in real estate was not taking the New Mexico market from Eckerd when we had a chance. We just didn't really understand the market, how much of a monopoly Walgreens had, and how much opportunity there was for profit there. CVS would try to enter the market on their own several years later, but to this day, they have struggled to get any real brand presence in New Mexico. And how did I end up being close enough to the godfather, Dino de Thomas, to hear that story? Well, that's the other great part of this story. Remember that eighth lease? The one in Arizona? It was the deal I told you about in the last episode. 75th Avenue and Bethany Home Road in Glendale, Arizona. Our very first deal. It had gotten delayed by zoning matters and fell behind the New Mexico stores in sequence. But we got the lease signed and we got it done. Not as an Eckerd, but as a CVS. And upon getting to know the CVS real estate team in the process, and based upon stories told to them by the Eckerd team that had elevated Damon and me to wunderkind status in the drugstore real estate game, CVS invited us a couple of years later to become one of four developers for them in Los Angeles County. Now, if we had the licensing budget for it here at Datages, I'm sure this is where my production team would insert the chorus of Going Back to Cali by LL Cool J or California Love by Tupac. But alas, we cannot offer you that entertainment value. Sorry. Nonetheless, the take-home message from this story from our Eckerd CVS saga is that by capturing the sense of urgency we were able to create in just one week, we set up the next 20 years of our careers and our lives in California. I lived and worked in SoCal until two years ago, 
when I moved to Dallas to escape the impacts of COVID in California. This is obviously a fairly dramatic example of a sense of urgency being put to work with equally dramatic results, but there are some more common applications of this approach. I'll share a few examples from my career in commercial real estate now. Let's first talk about property acquisitions. Very rarely in my career do I buy things that are for sale. I don't know if you've ever tried to convince someone to sell you something that's not for sale, but I can tell you it's not easy. It takes a delicate balance of patience and persistence to work through the process. The first most important step is getting to the first no. And then from there, you have to work from that no to a yes. And oftentimes, this is a competitive process because once you do convince someone to sell something, then suddenly you'll find lots of other people coming out of the woodwork to buy the same asset. Let's talk about a very recent example of this process from my company, Aventine. One of our acquisitions team members, Joe, was pursuing a great redevelopment property in Alabama, across the street from a Walmart and adjacent to a CVS. It was an excellent property, and it fit perfectly into our development program for the Alabama market. It took a lot of persistent hunting to even identify the actual owner of the property, which turned out to be a church group based in Louisiana. Joe started to engage with the leaders of the church and was getting a lukewarm response. They were interested in disposing of the property, but there was a complicated and not totally rational decision-making process that the church needed to go through to sell the property. Joe worked with them, educated them about the value of the property, established credibility for us as a buyer. Basically, he did everything he was supposed to do. But we got the sense they were going to sell the property to a local developer who wanted to convert it into a residential project. I promptly dispatched Joe to Louisiana to go meet with the church leaders. Remember, when all else fails, just show up. He got to the church office, met with the church leaders, and they confirmed our suspicions. They had decided to sell the property to a local developer. He had offered not more, but less than we did, but they just felt more comfortable with him, and it had nothing to do with price. Joe shared all of this with me from his car after leaving the meeting. I said, Joe, turn around. Go back there. Let them know you've been authorized to increase the price by $1 million if they sell it to us. He went back, delivered the message, and guessed what? They agreed. It may not have been a matter of price, but at the end of the day, we were able to make it a matter of price. Joe shared the story of his victory enthusiastically, and he got in the car and headed to another meeting in Alabama. A win for Aventine. Not so fast, my friend. The next day, the church leader sent Joe an email indicating they had reversed their decision, were selling the property to the local developer, and the contract was already signed. No need for him to return to the church office. Don't. Did I fail to finish the dadage for you? When all else fails, just show up, bring donuts, and don't leave until the ink is dry on the contract. Joe had to learn this lesson the hard way. What you can see is that not only is it critical to create a sense of urgency, it's critical to follow through and see the endeavor to completion. Now let's talk about another kind of deal making in our industry that has slowed to geologic pace in the past several years. I'm talking about retail leasing. The process of marketing a property for lease, identifying prospective tenants, engaging with them, getting their attention, and then working toward a deal used to take weeks. Now it takes months possibly a year or more. Some of this has to do with the marketplace. While the majority of retailers need to continue to grow, they are very slow to make decisions. This comes back to one of the characteristics of organizations that I shared earlier. The real estate representatives for most major national companies are far more concerned about making a mistake than they are about making a good deal. In my experience, they're happy to lose several good deals to avoid making a mistake and being held accountable. There's a supply and demand equation here as well. There are a lot of commercial developers out there chasing after the same quality tenants. Everyone wants to work with the handful of tenants that have sound business models and strong credit ratings because they are the only ones that are investment worthy in today's uncertain world. So even though there are very few projects being developed right now, any vacancy anywhere is being marketed to the same group of tenants. So the tenants continue to have way too many choices being put in front of them. I've spoken before about decision paralysis and the fact that 
One of the worst things you can offer a national retail tenant is a choice. They just have too many choices today. I keep hearing that the supply of real estate available to these tenants is going to dry up and that the dynamics are going to shift back in favor of developers and landlords, but it's just simply not materializing. I see a lot of developers that are willing to make very bad business decisions just for the sake of making a deal. And that mentality is artificially supporting the competitive landscape for retail leasing. Deals are getting done, but I'm not convinced anyone is making any money in the process. So how do we try to combat this circumstance? Some of this comes down to marketing. You need to cultivate as much demand as possible for any asset in order to create a sense of urgency to push a deal forward with a tenant. One of the things I often say is, if you want to make one deal in real estate leasing, you better have at least two probably three, deals on hand. Competitive pressure is one of the only forces that can actually accelerate a leasing program. I'm going to sound a little like a broken record here, but one of the key approaches in leasing is to show up. If you can create a way to get face-to-face with your tenant relationships, you have a much greater chance of being able to secure a deal with them. This is one of the reasons that our company has adopted a programmatic development model where we don't just develop properties and then try to lease them to tenants on a one-off basis. Instead, we develop strategic programs with the tenants for multiple locations. By doing so, we are able to create a deeper and more meaningful engagement with the tenant. This allows us not only to have a reason to get together and meet with them at their office, but it also often will allow us to elevate our business dealings to a more senior executive within a company and and get real attention on strategic deal making. The ability to identify the decision maker in an organization and to interface directly with that decision maker is fundamental to timely execution of business deals. I'll confess, general retail leasing is one of the greatest weaknesses in my organization, but we are very successful in these more strategic programmatic engagements with executive leaders when we can make that happen. I'm going to share with you one more key tactic for leasing or really any form of deal-making for that matter. Now listen carefully to this one. Take note and think about it. But be very careful and thoughtful about employing it, because it's a powerful tool, but can also be a double-edged sword. The technique I'm talking about is the takeaway. One of the only ways to compel action in business deal-making is to create a deadline, and to make it clear that the deal will go away if the deadline is missed. Sometimes these deadlines are very real. You might have a piece of property under contract, for example, and if you can't cut a deal with a tenant by the time the contract runs out, you may have to let it go. Or you might have an alternative deal on the table, and that party has given you a deadline to move forward. Other times, though, you have to manufacture these deadlines. But if you do this, you must follow through. If you're going to kick a tenant out of a deal for failure to meet your deadline, you have to adhere to that. You can't put a deadline out there and then back away from it, or else you lose credibility altogether, not only for that deal, but for any future dealings with the other party. Here's an example of how you might employ such a strategy. Oftentimes, you can create a logical but completely fabricated institutional framework within your own organization and use that to create a deadline and a sense of urgency. I will often refer to a board meeting or investment committee that is coming up on a certain date, and I'll say that I must have the deal ready to submit to that meeting. These are features that exist in much larger companies, but don't actually exist within my company. But they usually aren't called into question if you assert them in a confident and matter-of-fact manner. The last comment I'll make about the takeaway is this. You can't fake the takeaway. What I mean is that you have to be honest with yourself. Are you truly willing to walk away from the deal? If you aren't, trying to play the takeaway isn't going to work. They will see right through you. Trust me, I've tried. The takeaway only works when you mean it. Next, let's move on to talking about a process that truly moves at a geologic pace in today's world. Contract negotiation. I think one of the worst things that ever happened to conducting business is word processing. I know that sounds like a silly statement. How would we function if we were all using typewriters and fax machines still? But here's what I mean. The advent of word processing has allowed people to engage in a new and different level of contract negotiation. In the good old days, you really had to want to make an edit to a document to put yourself or your attorney 
or your secretary through the process of creating another draft or making edits to the physically typed document. Today, rather than having a burden of creating a new draft of a document every time you want to edit something, you can theoretically negotiate an agreement in perpetuity, analyzing and correcting every single period and comma going back and forth and back and forth with endless drafts. Trust me, I've seen it happen. It's just way too easy to continue negotiating documents ad infinitum in today's world. This is obviously a complete oversimplification of the circumstances surrounding modern contract negotiation, but I feel it is a truly impactful technological change versus one or two business generations ago. The majority of the challenges in contract negotiation are not technological, though. They have to do with people and organizations. Many of the same principles I've talked about in other instances apply here. Often an organization will be structured to reward individuals in a deal-making capacity for getting deals done, but such incentives don't exist for attorneys employed to finalize the deals. The attorneys are judged for their mistakes, not rewarded for succeeding in getting a deal done. And we often joke that it seems like attorneys get paid by the word. There's a lot of truth to this humor, though. Attorneys are paid by the hour, and if a lease got done too quickly and easily, the attorney would start to seem less essential to the leasing process altogether. There's also a lot of institutional bravado and pride of authorship that goes into contract negotiation. Large companies pride themselves on having standardized leases that contain certain provisions that they try to apply universally. And then the individual attorneys who get involved in negotiating the documents also take great pride in every word they write within a document. Oftentimes, these perspectives create a major impediment to making reasonable and logical changes to legal documents. The other frustratingly confounding personality trait of many attorneys is what I call superhero syndrome. There are a lot of attorneys that take pride in beating up landlords on the opposite side of the table in a negotiation process in order to show their negotiating prowess to their client. How do we try to counter all of these challenges? Well, we rely upon many of the same tactics I've already shared with you. In negotiating important leases, we will often try to get face-to-face, even if that means that I personally have to get on a plane and fly to meet with the attorney somewhere. This harkens back to lessons learned from my Eckert experience. When you are face-to-face with someone, it is harder for them to be unreasonable. It's also harder for them to avoid you and avoid working with you to resolve any disputes or differences within a document. When you aren't sitting there with somebody it's far too easy for them to set aside something perceived as difficult to go work on something that seems much easier. I also do my best to be very concrete in working through lease negotiations. I focus not on philosophical arguments. I focus on real-world practical business examples of circumstances that we have encountered within our company or circumstances that have been shared with me by my father from 50 years of experience in the real estate industry. My father often says that you can read a company's entire history by reading one of its contracts. I can tell you that a lot of our agreements have evolved over time based upon my own personal experiences of the last 25 years. I've also learned to pick my battles. It has been hard for me to learn to set aside what I know is logically correct or what I believe to be eminently fair and reasonable and focus on what it takes to get deals done. Not every deal deserves to get done. But if you're committed to getting a particular deal done, sometimes you have to set certain matters aside to stay focused on the primary objective. Eyes on the prize. Let me give you a couple of points of advice and guidance in this regard. The first is to understand the importance of the agreement itself. To illustrate this, let me talk about the difference between a land purchase contract and a lease with a tenant. A land purchase contract is a short-term document that lives for only the time period that you are under contract to purchase the land. And once you buy the land, the contract essentially goes away. By contrast, a commercial lease can go on for decades. Obviously, you can see that at a document level, a commercial lease is far more a critical document than a purchase agreement is. If you have to live with a lease forever, you better spend time working through all of the fine points to make sure you get it right. Otherwise, you could be setting yourself up for a lot of trouble down the road. Next, it's important to ask yourself, 
what is my role in this particular deal and how does that influence how much I want to negotiate the document? If I'm negotiating a lease for a property that I know I'm going to sell, the standard I apply to negotiate in the document is that I need to make sure that the provisions of the lease are not any worse than any of the other leases that are available in the marketplace. If a prospective buyer looks at this lease, they shouldn't see anything in it that is a red flag that makes this particular asset any less valuable than any other asset in which this particular tenant has signed a lease. I can tell you that the bar is much lower for the general landlord population than it is for our internal standards for leasing. So with that being said, if we intend to own a project long term, we have to apply our standards to the lease negotiation. I often hear from tenants, none of our other landlords bring up this topic in our leases. To that, my reply is always, thank you for the compliment. Now, if you want to talk about truly infinite timelines, let's discuss governmental approvals. A big part of the commercial real estate development business is working with government authorities and quasi-governmental agencies like utility companies to get the approvals required to build a project. You've probably heard me say by now that the job of a real estate developer is to make everyone else in the world happy, and if there's any money left after doing that, the developer did his job well. The majority of the people that have to be satisfied in the development process fall into the category of municipal authorities. And believe me, it's possible to not have any money left after dealing with all of them. It's important to recognize that most positions in government are established as gatekeepers, not advocates. I know that the traffic guy exists only to tell me no until I've satisfied the traffic requirements. The tree lady exists only to tell me no until I've met all the tree requirements. The stormwater team at the city exists only to tell me no until I've met all the stormwater requirements. None of these individuals are incentivized to help me achieve my objectives but they can certainly come under fire if I develop a project that doesn't make people happy in the city. Not that I've ever done that in my career. Meeting all of their requirements is a slow and painstaking process. What approaches have we learned to working with municipal employees and agencies? Let me tell you, this is where the donuts really come in handy. Every project needs a donut fund, but it's often not enough just to show up and meet with municipal employees. It also matters greatly who shows up and what language they speak. I'm not speaking literally about English, French, German, or Spanish. What I mean is that every municipal agency has its own jargon and communicates in its own way. Engineers speak engineerish. Planners speak planish. And city attorneys speak legalish. Trust me, none of them speak English. It's important to mirror the party with whom you're engaging. I'll always enlist my traffic engineer to talk to the city or state traffic engineers because they speak the same language. Similarly, I get my civil engineer to talk to the city engineer, and I get my attorney to talk to the city attorney. I'm perfectly capable of having most of these discussions on my own. By this point in my career, I'm what my attorneys call a cowboy lawyer, and I'm definitely an armchair civil engineer by now but I will take the extra time and spend the extra money to engage someone on my team that communicates effectively with the agency in question. The other important aspect of this engagement is to give yourself a local face. As you all know by now, I work all over the country, and now in Central Europe as well. While I have distinct advantages coming to a market with a fresh perspective to develop new projects, there is tremendous value to being a local especially in small towns where the good old boy factor is off the charts. We always hire local civil engineers, attorneys, and consultants for this reason. I found the one-two punch of my fresh outsider's perspective, married with homegrown talent, works very well in dealing with municipal agencies. Well, friends and family, I hope the stories and examples I've shared today help you to understand the importance of creating a sense of urgency and accomplishing objectives in business in a very real way. As I said earlier, in the second episode of this two-part series, we will talk about application of these concepts and structuring efficient project management processes. And until then, I'll leave you all with this little story about time management. I was running late yesterday, so I stopped to purchase a clock. Why? I just wanted to buy some time. 
And then when I got home, I threw it out the window. Why? Because I also wanted to see time fly. Remember, Dadage's friends and family, Dad may not always know what he's talking about, but he sure can sound like he does. Thank you for listening to Dadages. If you enjoyed this episode, remember to visit dadages.com and subscribe to the Dadages podcast to get notified for future episodes. You can rate or review on Spotify and Apple Podcast. Why? Because I'm your father and I said so. Just a little respect is all I ask for. I put a roof over your head and food on the table and what do you do? No, tell me exactly what do you do because I am doing everything. I'm paying for everything. No, get back here. Get back here right now.